Hi, this is David Davis, and I'm honored to be joined today by really a, a, a legend and a leading innovator in the storage world, uh, Mr. Frankie Rue Parvar, uh, who is the COO, COO of Skyera. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. So I understand you have over, is it 450 patents? I think last count was like 480 or 490, but I'm, wow. not, I'm not looking at it. <laughs> That's incredible. It's incredible. So can you give me some examples of some of the things that you've innovated over time, patented over time? You know, I, I think I've, I've been in the non-volatile memory industry for about 30 years now. And so I've been involved with a lot of uh, very disruptive technologies. Mm -hmm. I was one of the co-founders of a company that Micron Technology bought and Micron Flash kind of came out of that activity. So having been from day one with the activity and growing it to now it's almost half of the you know, very large company. I've been involved on the development side, engineering side. So the patents cover you know, system level, software level, uh, the NAND flash itself, the cells, cell structure, you know, from device physics all the way to managing it all the way up. So fascinating. So uh, the, the flash in my iPhone I have to you, thank to you. Well, <laughs> you, you to can some thank degree. many people, but I, sure. I guess I feel like I had a little bit to do with it. Yeah, it's that's amazing. So it's a real pleasure to be you know talking to you today. And um, you know, I, I come from kind of the average uh, data center administrator perspective, mm -hmm. uh, IT manager, and so forth. And um, I, I talk a lot about you know virtualization and storage, and I think a lot of uh, you know average data center admins today. Uh, there's a lot of disruption in the storage space, a lot of innovation, and mm -hmm. you know they're really being barraged by all these different you know storage solutions, and many of them have to do with uh, flash you know technologies. And I was hoping that you could just give us a little bit of you know maybe history and background and, and education um, on flash. So uh, you know what can you what can you tell us uh, to to help us uh, you know guide our way through the the sort of chaos of, of the storage market today? Sure, uh, you know, I think NAND flash is now used in storage, but NAND flash itself is a memory. So okay. if I was to step back and start from beginning of time, if you mm -hmm. will, you know, as I said, I've been involved with non-volatile memories. And what, what that means is, is a memory that once you take the power away, it remembers what you wrote to it. Kind of like a hard disk drive. Right. But hard disk drives are magnetic based, they're not semiconductor based. So if you start with that in mind, then there are certain things you can look at a criteria or characteristics of a memory technology. Um, you know, there's things like, uh, you know, is it volatile or non-volatile? For instance, DRAM and SRAM are not, they're volatile because once you take the power away, you bring it back, the data is gone. Then you have a category of memory is called non-volatile. And then they have criteria such as, uh, you know, what is the t how long does it take for you to write to it? Is, is it a byte writable or do I have to erase a whole basic block and rewrite it? Okay. So there are many criteria like this. So, you know, just as kind of a broad background, uh, if you will, I can start by saying, you know, non-volatile memories have been around since the beginning of time. If you look at cavemen, I'm, I'm using that as an example to, to kind of introduce the concepts that, yeah. that you can look at. Yeah, please. If you go to the cavemen, you know, the, the walls of the cave were non-volatile memories because now after hundreds of thousands of years, we see what they wrote. So it kept the data there for a while, right? The problem with that is if you, if you take a, a stone and, you know, chisel a stone, you can think of that as write time. How quickly can you write? So that was a very slow write time, yeah, because it would take you years to you yeah. know, chisel something, right? But then you could read it. And then the other thing is retention. Retention is how long would the data stay there? You know, for instance, on current flash devices, they say one year. If you don't do anything with the data for a year, the data is gone. So you can't reliably come back and get it. So a retention on a, on a cave wall or stuff like that, as long as there is no light hitting it, and you know, it's millions of years, we can still see some of those uh, artifacts from way yeah. back when, right? Then people moved on to, let's say, paper, because you, know, you couldn't take a long time to write stuff, right? So they went to paper, and they started writing books, and and now you look at it, the write time is a lot faster. You can write pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the other concept is how long would that stay? In, inside that paper, depending on the ink you used, the retention, how mm -hmm. long would the data stay, could be variable, right? depending on the conditions. Uh, if, if you put it on the water, you, know, you lose the data, right? Yeah. Uh, however, 
this other co concept of cycling. How, how many times can you write? Now, on a piece of paper, you can't write over the other words because you can't read it, right? So you can erase it and then write to it. It's, it's sort of the same parallel to the flash. I'm just trying to yeah. get the concepts across. So how many times can you erase a piece of paper and write it? I don't know, 10 times before the paper starts to kind of rip apart. So if you look at this, the concepts have been around for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Now, in the early stages of um, use of non-volatile memories in computing, you know, hard disk drives have been used, tapes have been used, and those are, again, non-volatile media, you know, and each one of them has a certain amount of write, certain amount of read, how quickly can you get the data off, is the data sequentially read out, and things like this. So there's a many, many things, and there are trade-offs between cost, you know, how many times you can change it, what's the retention on them. And, Durability and of the medium. Exactly, yeah. 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 So, you know, I think, uh, the, the majority of storage today in enterprise, about 99.7%, is based on non-semiconductor-based stuff. So Flash sort of introduced the concept of bringing in um, uh, a, you know, a non-volatile in a, in a semiconductor base, and you have a lot of advantages there. Advantages are there's no moving parts. Mm -hmm. As a result, you, know, you can read and write pretty quickly. I mean, you don't have to wait for the seek to you know, find the right sector on the magnetic stuff. And it allows you to miniaturize a lot quickly, mm -hmm. right? Because when, when you're trying to make a, a hard drive and make it smaller and smaller, the screws in there are getting so small and tiny, the reliability is not that great. And so, but the problem that Flash has is what they call cycling. How many okay. times can you, it's just like that paper, how many times can you erase and write to it? Yeah. You know, starting about four or five years ago, um, well, but let, me, let me step one back. The, within Flash, there are multiple technologies. There is the NOR Flash and there's the NAND Flash. Okay. And the difference between those is NOR Flash is more for random access, mm -hmm. and you know, but the cells are much larger, and so the cost is much higher. Right. Okay. So in cases where you want to get uh, you know small amount of data quickly in and out, you use NOR Flash. Mm -hmm. NAND Flash on the other side, effectively came in crammed a lot of memory into a very small space. You still have to read in a kind of an access manner that is not random. You can't just go grab stuff and write, uh, you know, write, write one byte. If you want to write something, you've got to go erase a whole block of a certain size, kind of like you use an eraser, and then you need to rewrite the whole thing back. Mm. So if you want to change one byte, you effectively have to copy everything out, erase this thing, modify that byte, put it back. It's more cumbersome than, than NORFLASH, but cost structure is much better. And it, you know, it's something that, you know, discussions with Rado and others, you know, the controllers and the technologies have learned with true software and firmware to be able to deal with it. So NAND flash is what's in, say, a, a MacBook Air today? That's correct. Okay. So NAND flash, I would say, um, funny story, NAND flash almost, I hear, died late 90s because people couldn't figure out what they could do with this thing. Mm. And uh, what I heard is, you know, it got designed into a answering machine. And that's what kept it alive. It's, it's kind of an interesting story. but. And now it's totally revolutionized the world, right? Mm -hmm. Once a, you know, the Apple iPad, you know, I, I, iPod, mm -hmm. I haven't used it for so long. Mm -hmm. So that designed it in, and all of a sudden they, they used to have, you know, you could put so many songs, but it was magnetic based. Yeah. And because of the fact that it's magnetic, you hit it, you know, it's, it doesn't take the shock and vibration very well. Mm -hmm. Once you switch to Flash and you could put 2,000 songs there, that was the beginning of Flash. The next stage was uh, digital cameras. As people started putting cards in there, that was the next use model for NAND flash. And so NAND flash became more and more dense and the cost became more and more uh, at a point where it could be used for very high volume and high capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem has been number of cycles. Uh, if you look at some papers that were published four or five years ago by some of the major um, uh, storage guys, what they said is that if you look at their system, and you look at, you know, if the thing should last three years, they did an average and say, well, you need somewhere between 30,000 to 50,000 cycles to be able to not burn it and, you know, kill the thing. Uh, if you go back three to five years on the NAND side, we were on the 0.7 uh, technology, 0.7 micron technology, and the cycling uh, on, on certain variations of NAND flash were somewhere in the 100,000 cycles. So, don't want to bore you guys, but a little bit deeper, there's multiple ways of storing data in a NAND flash. 
So I've heard of like SLC and MLC yeah. and different yeah. acronyms, but yes. I think a, a lot of us have heard of them, but they don't really understand okay. what they mean. So in general, what that means is I got so many physical cells. Okay. Let's say 128 gigabits uh, today, the largest capacity. The 128 gigabit has that many physical cells. If I do a SLC, which is single level cell, okay. I basically am putting one bit of data in each one. And the way we're doing it, we basically are injecting electrons into a floating gate. A floating gate means, you know, we have a piece of silicon that's sitting not connected to anything. But if you create enough of a field, you can actually get electrons to inject through, let's say, glass. And once they're there, they have nowhere to go because, the, you know, the glass is surrounding it, right? That's <laughs> the whole basic uh, non-volatile memory. Now, if you inject enough electrons into a cell, all of a sudden it goes from one to zero or zero to one, depending on, you know, the way the chip is designed. Now, so that's your SLC. Okay. The good thing is reliability is pretty good. You know, reliability meaning how long can I leave the data in there and not lose it, right? Because mm -hmm. you have so many electrons and you're gonna lose some of them, mm -hmm. but there's enough of a margin between what you call a one and a one is zero that it takes a long time for the data to. So reliability of SLC is good. The speed of SLC is good because you just power up the cell and say, Am I conducting or not conducting because of what's in the, in the floating gate? And it's a quick, quick thing. So it's fast and it's very reliable, but it's expensive. Okay. Now, MLC is called multi-level cell. What that means is I'm not putting two bits, two logical bits into a physical cell. So now if a cell has to figure out, you know, the two cells, there are four states. It's either both are zero, one is zero, one is one, one is one, one is zero, and they're both one. Mm. So by putting an MLC, which is multi-level cell, by putting two bits in a single cell, you need to distinguish between four different states. Okay. So what NAND has done over the years is figured out that I will move a bucket of charge for the first state. I'll move twice the bucket for, in, in a very simplistic way, right? Uh, it, it's a lot more complicated, but we apply enough of a field to move it from this state to this state. And then we say, okay, we really, I want that on the third state. So Depending on what the cell is, we spend a lot of time writing to it. And then what happens though is because your total electric field across this is the same, you're taking the reliability of SL cell and chopping it into four pieces. Now, when you want to go from this state to this state, you have much less room. A, it takes you longer to write, mm -hmm. and B, your reliability is a lot less because you know, now there's much less room to go make a mistake from one state to another state. Okay. So that's what happens over time that when you go from SLC to MLC, you improve your cost by 2x because now every cell is two bits. So you can cram twice as much mm. data, but your write time is increased and your reliability of the cell it decreases. Okay. Right? So, but your cost is improved. So if you look a couple of generations back, SLC was about 100,000 cycles. So it was well beyond what enterprise needed. And then MLC was about 10,000, 15,000 cycles during that time. So when Rado was talking about Sandforest doing stuff that made it 10x better, you could take some of these MLCs that didn't have a good reliability, using that technology, you would make it look a lot better. And you could now use something that was twice as cheap into the environment of enterprise. Now what has happened though, as every generation, um, we shrink in both dimensions. So the cells are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm. So this prison that we create, that we pump electrons into is getting less and less. So now if you imagine if they were, we're getting to a point where, you know, we went from millions of electrons getting injected to move the states to now hundreds of electrons. Now, and if fewer the electrons escape, you're now moving the state of the cell around. So as we're shrinking the cell smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. effectively what we're doing is making the reliability a lot worse, the retention a lot worse. So as we started from 100,000 cycles and let's say 15 to 20,000 cycles of MLC, today, you know, SLC is somewhere in the 30,000 cycles. Mm -hmm. So it's come down by three to four X. And I would say MLC is somewhere between two to 3,000 cycles. So it's come down significantly. So the challenge therefore is, how do you take a technology that is improving in cost, because you need it to improve in cost so you can put more of the stuff in the boxes like this, right. but how do I make sure that it's reliable enough yeah. that we can, we can use them? And that's the technology we have, we call it life amplification, and rather had some discussion about what are all the tricks that we do to improve 
the um, reliability and endurance of the of the flash. Fascinating. So, in a, a typical consumer laptop today, is that a an MLC flash disk? Yes. Okay. And then in the enterprise, um, the enterprise is slowly moving to MLC flash as well. Yeah. So, so let me one other state that was created called EMLC, okay. e Enterprise MLC. Oh. Uh, as flash vendors, we basically design a single chip, mm -hmm. and I can either run it in SLC or MLC. Okay. And I will charge a lot more for the SLC version because of the fact that the reliability is 10, 10x more. Mm. So, so even though the cost is too much, 2x, the price is a lot more. Therefore, it's very non-friendly to, to enterprise. Now, then you go to MLC, and MLC say, okay, well, it's only 3,000 cycles. But what happens is inside the flash, when we were designing the flash, there are what we call trims or knobs inside. You can mm -hmm. actually adjust the operating mode of every circuit. You could make the, the amount of time it takes to program or erase more or less. And what it does, it, there is a direct impact to the reliability of the cell itself or the memory itself. So there are ways you can go and change some of the settings to perhaps slow down the programming just a little bit and get maybe five to 10 X more endurance out of it. Mm. And so knowing that the flash itself that is used for your um, iPads or iPhones or whatever, those things are designed for a very kind of a use case of, I want a, I want a certain price point, mm -hmm. really cheap because mm -hmm. it's high volume. And we don't really care about the performance and we want to basically have something that lasts X amount of time. Okay. Enterprise is different. Enterprise, they're willing to give up on some of those things in exchange for getting some other parameters. For instance, uh, and, and, you know, a normal cell in a flash, we optimize it, we used to optimize it, since I don't work there anymore, for a kind of a general purpose you know, target and we would optimize all these settings to make sure we support that you have ways to go ahead and optimize it for a different use case, let's say an enterprise. Okay. And by just changing the trims and some of that knowledge that people have inside the flash companies, they could make it last a lot longer. But in exchange for that, they're asking for more money. They call it EMLC, enterprise MLC. Uh, okay. So they take the same flash, mm -hmm. they massage it differently, and they sell it for a higher price. And the Enterprise guys saying, okay, I either pay 7x for SLC. I'm just throwing a number out. And that's mm -hmm. not accurate. But then I can pay, let's say, 1.5 or 2x for EMLC. I'll buy the EMLC. Okay. Right? So what we're bringing to the equation is, is, as Rather said, one of the reasons I joined here was realizing that when you build uh, products like this, where 90% of the bill of material is flash. Mm -hmm. You really need to understand the internal workings of the flash and really optimize your entire stack of software and support to, to deal with the media itself. Mm -hmm. You know, other competitors, you know, they buy the entire finished thing either out of EMLC and they're paying a lot more. And those are not the things that we've chosen to do. We, we're buying the basic thing and based on the knowledge that we have and the relationships we have, we basically are able to take this mass mass adopted NAND flash, we call them MAN flash, most advanced NAND flash. Oh. We're taking that and are able to take that and make it last long enough for enterprise use. Fascinating, fascinating. I mean, so inside here is the MAN, man flash, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm actually sitting in front of a box that can hold 2.5 petabytes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just incredible scalability, incredible performance that I have no doubt will change, you know, the 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 world really you know mm -hmm. as as we said uh, you know reducing power consumption reducing the footprint of data centers even scaling down or eliminating data centers um, all through you know your innovations uh, in flash technology you know over the over uh, the past what would you say thirty years thirty years <laughs> wow so it's really an honor and a pleasure to be sitting with you here Thank and you. learning about flash technology thanks so much Frankie thank you very much.